I'm delighted to have this opportunity to preach this morning. I'm sorry for the situation that necessitated it, that being Pastor Brian having contracted the flu. I'm glad he's home and not here. Tim, am I on? No? Tim, am I on? I'm on. Good. I'm on. Uh, anyway, the girls, Brian's girls, asked him upon becoming aware that he had the flu if he liked pizza. He said, why? And they said, that's the only thing we're going to be able to slide under the door to you for the next several days. <laughs> Thank you also for your prayers. I've had uh, some problems with my heart, and uh, I actually am supposed to be in uh, Accra, Ghana this morning with my cohorts who are there teaching, and next week in Lome, Togo, but God in his sovereignty and mercy had other plans, and I'm here, um, and I'm delighted to be here. I could have been with him there, and that'd be okay, but uh, for for his purposes, he's... Um, in the process of healing up my physical heart. And uh, I appreciate your prayers so much. He's, he's actually performed a mini heart bypass for me and uh, got all kind of collateral arteries and they're working pretty good as long as I don't get overly excited. <laughs> that hasn't happened in many years, so uh, I'm not worrying about that. I'm also honored to have those of you who I haven't seen in a long time, uh, those of you who used to be members here, those of you who used to attend our Bible conference, when it's good to see you. Um, I hope you're not like George McDavid, since he already told me, I'll tell everybody else. He said, I just wanted you to know that Manly Beasley was one of my favorite evangelists, and I put you up there with him, and I decided the last opportunity I got to go see him, I might need to go see him because I might not ever see him again. So <laughs> thank you, George, for your kindness. And reminding me of my mortality and reminding you that you're not too far behind. <laughs> Amen? Well, this is a topical message this morning. I'm more given to expositional preaching, but this is a topical message. And that is, I've taken a topic, one that's weighed on my heart heavily for a, a number of days, especially in these last couple of weeks. And, and so I'm going to deal with that and and basically, I have some scripture to support the topic. That's kind of the way topical preaching is. But I believe there's a good word from the Lord for all of us this morning. So, having said that, I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the gospel according to John chapter 1. And this passage that scholars refer, refer to, the first 18 verses, as the prolegomena which is a fancy word for simply John telling us what he's going to tell us. Uh, that's good preaching. The old black preacher said, here's the way I preach. He says, I tell them what I'm going to tell them. I tell them, then I told them what I told them. That's good preaching. It's a prolegomena. So verse 1 through 18 is a, is a sketch, a, an outline of what is to follow in the Gospel of John but for our time this morning, one tremendous passage of Scripture, and I'm reading from the NIV because um, I, I think it's cool to be able to hold a little New Testament like this. And, and besides, it hurts my arthritic wrist to hold up that big Bible. <laughs> <So> <laughs> this is the reason I've got my little Bible. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. The ESV says the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. I like the old King James says, who was in the bosom of the Father. That's the same word that is used of John leaning on the breast of of Jesus in John chapter 13. It means extremely close proximity. In fact, 
This passage begins in verse one that says the word was with God and God was the word. Pros, the Greek word, means literally face to face with God. Jesus, the word, second person of the Trinity, was face to face with God. No man has ever seen God at any time, but Jesus has revealed, being in closest relationship with the Father, he has made him known, exegeseto, to make known, means to exegete, to, to, to bring out and to demonstrate and manifest who God is. Continuing to turn over to invading the territory that Pastor Brian is so masterfully expounding. John chapter 14, and hopefully not intruding too far into his future plans for this passage. I want to pick up a couple of verses in John chapter 14, verses 7 through 9, actually three verses. If you, Jesus is answering uh, questions of his disciples who are very anxious about being without him. And he says in verse seven, if you really know me, you will know my father as well. Now I want you to pay attention to this word. Here's the key word, father. Back up in uh, verse six, comes to the father. He says, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do not, from now on you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And then if you just cast your eyes further, verse 10, the Father, the Father. Verse 11, the Father and the Father. Now turning back to the front of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 11, just prior to those well-known verses of 28 and 29 where the invitation of Jesus is come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I want to uh, call your attention to verse 27. Jesus is speaking and he said, all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows, that is epignosis, knowledge upon knowledge. Not just knowledge firsthand, but firsthand, firsthand knowledge. Knowledge upon knowledge. No one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Pray with me. Holy Spirit, would you be pleased to attend this moment, these moments together with your people by your hand resting upon me to speak and your people to hear and the gift of faith to wrap around it and believe that you're speaking and we receive. May we be like the Bereans who gladly receive the word and then afterward search the scriptures to see if it were true. Glorify yourself and Holy Spirit through Jesus the Lord, through your word. Show us the Father in a clear way this morning and heal Father wounds, I pray in Jesus' strong name. Amen and amen. This subject, as I mentioned earlier, has been rolling around in my mind for many days. I want to speak to you on this subject bullet wounds and the father wound. Let me say that again. Bullet wounds and the father wound. Our nation is still reeling and raging at one another from the tragic events of the latest mass school shooting. The rate of mass shootings has tripled since 2011. And even before the bodies of the victims are cold, the reactions are very predictable. Liberals want to ban guns. Conservatives propose a variety of measures to shut up liberals and keep the Second Amendment intact. But hear me carefully in my humble and normally accurate opinion. Neither liberals nor conservatives get the solution right. 
Hear me again. Neither liberals, leftists, conservatives, or far right get the solution right, at least not fully. The real problem in our country isn't guns or lack of governmental enforcement of laws on the books, but generally the absence of human fathers and particularly the absence of the real, true, ultimate father, our father, which art in heaven. I'm going to read a rather lengthy quote from Pastor Doug Wilson in a brilliant blog that he penned not too long after the latest mass shooting. And I quote, do you want real systemic analysis? We don't need to do anything about the guns, but we do need to do something about all the fatherless boys who are loaded up with psychotropic drugs administered by the school nurse and educated by a school system that is prohibited by law from telling anybody what the meaning of life is all about. That is your toxic mix. And if you don't want to do anything about it, then you need to stop pretending that you want a systemic solution. First, we took away God the Father. And you, the student body, are nothing more than meat and bones and protoplasm. The end result of so many year, million years of blind and idiotic forces imposing their deterministic and grinding fate on matter and energy. <clears throat> For decades, it has been a requirement of the curriculum that students be taught that they're the accidental products of a big bang. They have been taught that they are only so many bits of plankton randomly mutated and evolved, floating meaninglessly on the sea of time. We have insisted that our children be taught that life is meaningless, that life came from nowhere and leads to nowhere. And that's the only logical conclusion from evolution, which is the religion of our school system, whether you agree or not. It's mandatory to be taught. A creator and creation has been outlawed, so God the Father has been dismissed from this system. Having taken away God the Father, we have substituted the state, a ramshackle federal father if there was ever one. So not only are we idolaters, we are clumsy idolaters, proving it by making a clumsy God in our own image whom we believe can solve our problems by passing more inept legislation when there's more inept legislation on the books than there's time to ever read in two lifetimes. Now, Pastor Doug didn't say that. I said that. It's the truth. But then I hear people following such incidents as took place in that school in Florida, saying, no, no, everyone cries, you're special, you're special. Life is special, every life is special. Since when? You cannot have the blood of 60 million aborted babies crying out from the dumpsters of our land and insist with any degree of integrity that every life is special. You cannot legislate the murder of babies and then wonder why one student might have the audacity to try to control his life whatever way he wishes. He learned his catechism well. He dreamed a dream, looked deep into his heart, and felt the rage and hate and pain and despair of being taught that might makes right, and choice is the highest good. And he chose to live consistently with the Big Bang and went through his old high school imitating the doctrine he was taught, snuffing out lies with one big bang after another, just enacting the creation myth that he was given. Sociologists lament that father, fatherlessness is the most harmful demographic trend in our generation. Tonight, over 43% of American children will go to sleep in homes in which fathers do not live. Listen to these statistics. 
63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 85% of all children who show behavior disorders come from fatherless homes. 80% of rapists with anger problems come from fatherless homes. 70% of youths in state-operated institutions comes from fatherless homes. 85% of all youths in prison come from fatherless homes. 75% of all adolescent patients in chemical abuse centers come from fatherless homes. But then comes the question, how about guns? Two of the strongest correlations with gun, with gun homicides are growing up in fatherless households and dropping out of school, which itself is directly related to lack of any active or present father. It's no coincidence that much like the number of fatherless children, the number of mass shootings has exploded since the 1960s. Throughout the entire 1960s, six mass shootings took place, 10-year period. That number doubled in 1970. In 2012 alone, we saw more mass shootings than all of the 60s did. Recently, Nicholas Cruz, 19-year-old from a fatherless home, shot and killed 17 people, wounded 15 others at Parkland, in Parkland, Florida High School. Does this horrific childhood justify what he did? No, 10,000 times no, but it is a common factor contributing to it. Adam Lanza, 20 years old, December 14, 2015, Sandy Hook Elementary School, killed 20 children and six adults. Lanza's parents were divorced and he hadn't seen his father in the two years before the Sandy Hook shooting. Jeff Wise, a 16 year old shooter in Red Lake, Minnesota High School, 2005, killed 10 people, nine and then himself. And his parents were separated before his birth and both of his parents were dead before he ever became a teenager. Was that justification? No, but it is a contributing factor. And the list goes on and on from Charleston churches and Dylan Ruth who killed nine people and who was with, in, in a fatherless home from Charleston churches to the Boston Marathon to the high school in Florida. The victims change, but the narrative remains the same. Unstable homes produce unstable individuals in more instances than not. The typical response in these shootings is gun control, which translates ultimately to gun confiscation and a disarmed citizenry. Listen again. No dads, no creation and creator, no morals, no truth, no right or wrong, no punishment of bullies, no fixed gender anymore, etc., etc. All of this has created the nihilistic, narcissistic, hedonistic society that we know as modern day America. Real and lasting change will not come by anyone's vote, by anyone in office. Real and lasting change will not come until father wounds are healed, not by medicines or by counselors, but by a repentant return to God, our Father that is in the heavens. God is called Father 15 times in the Old Testament, 245 times in the New Testament. In the Gospel of John alone, God is called Father 100 times. And in the passage that Pastor Brian is so masterfully expounding, the Upper Room Discourse, John 13 through 17, Father is mentioned 51 times. Did you hear what I said? In chapters 13 through 17, Jesus mentions the name Father, Father God, 51 times. Now of all the names and titles of God, none is more precious, more promising, and currently more politically incorrect as is the term father. Radical feminists want to replace the heavenly father with the earth mother. 
Many Bible printing companies are now producing what they call gender-inclusive translations that refuse to acknowledge God as Father and the sons of God as His only children. We're told that the concepts of a Father God, a fatherhood, and of all fathers in general have had its day. That we must get away from patriarchal societies, but that's That's long ago. Now we must get away from matriarchal societies and we must live in gender fluid societies so you can be whatever you want to be, whenever you want to be it, male today, female tomorrow, and the combination of two the next day are nothing if you don't want to be anything. Is that crazy or what? But there is a father-shaped vacuum in the heart of us all. And it's been there since Adam for some inexplicable reason did what he did in the Garden of Eden. Listen to this passage. Don't try to turn there. Just listen to it very quickly. Luke Luke chapter 6, verse 38. It's a genealogy. And it goes all the way back from Joseph the stepfather, all the way back to uh, from Mary all the way back to Adam. And here's what it says, Luke 6, 38. Adam, the son of God. <laughs> Adam, the son of God. We usually think of Adam just as the, the creature that the creator made, the first man, and he was. But he's called in scripture by the inspiring spirit of God, the son of God. He was the first human son of God. And God didn't make him like he made everything else. If you read Genesis, it said, God said, let there be, and there was. God said, let there be, and there was. But when it came to man, he came down and he took the dust and he formed it into this image and likeness of himself and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul and the first face that Adam looked upon was the loving face of his father. Of his father. It was the master piece of his creation, a son of God. The first voice that Adam heard was father's voice. He saw the first face the glorious face of his father. The first touch that he felt was the touch of his father. His first emotion was awaked in response to the love of a father. Why did father make him? Not out of necessity, not out of loneliness, but out of the sheer delight of wanting something would reflect and extend the glory and the beauty of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so love is what created Adam because God, as to his essential nature, is love. And everything that he does is out of that essential, unchangeable nature. So when he looked into the face of Adam, love looked into a loved one, and Adam knew that he was loved from the very outset. And then his whole being came alive in an atmosphere of love. And then for some, some idiotic, inexplicable reason in that perfect environment with a perfect father and in his own heart, the life and love of God crying, Abba, 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 Father. Adam, believe the enemy's lie and distrusted the Father's heart and wrapped faith around that unbelief. And from that moment, the light went out, the life went out, and there was a blink in Adam's heart as he now found himself with an orphan spirit on the outside looking in, fearful of God, trying to cover his shame, and an emptiness there wondering where, where, What will happen? Who is this God now? What will he do with me? All of those things because now he's fatherless. Yes, even more so he has even another father as Jesus said in John 8, you are of your father the devil. But the good news is the father made plans for that before he ever shaped that first man. 
And before the first man, Adam, had breath breathed into his nostrils, the last Adam, Jesus, had already made preparations to come to this earth through the womb of a virgin and live a sinless life and die in our place on the cross. That's all according to the good news of the great and glorious gospel of our Father, which art in heaven. So there's a father-shaped vacuum in every heart. And, and, and we're searching for a human father or a father figure to meet the needs that only the heavenly father can meet. Dr. J.I. Packer asks, what is a Christian? And then he replies, answers. The question can be answered in many ways, but the richest answer I know is that a Christian is one who has God as father. Father is the Christian name for God. Father is the Christian name for God. Now all of that was by way of introduction. Don't worry, the sermon is just an addendum to the introduction, but it's the best part. Here's the big Roman numeral one. Fatherhood is defined by the Son, Jesus, and known only in the Son. That's what those verses say that I read to you. The sum of those verses simply say that fatherhood, who the father is, is defined by the son and is found only and known only in the son. He said, no man knows the father except by me. No man can come to the father except by me. Now, ladies, don't take exception. The word son and fatherhood, I'm using this generically for in the sonship status of daughters and sons, okay? If I can be called the wife of Christ, you can be called the sons of God. Fair deal, okay? Both of them are good and both of them are true. So we're talking about sons and sonship. Before going any further, I need to clarify a modern misconception. Although all of God's uh, people, all, 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 all human beings, let me say it that way, have God as their creative father, he is only the redemptive father of those who've come to know him through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the creator and, and every person will give an account to him in that role and in that sense, all creation is a prodigal son away from God. But those who come to God through Christ have been redeemed and they have become sons of the father in the faith of the father. So, Ephesians 3, 14 and 15 says, Paul praying, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Well, what these verses teach is that all human fatherhood comes from God. And that means fatherhood is not a role that God feels, but his very nature. It exists within humanity only because we've been made in the image of God. Now those, there, there are those, and I've heard this argument for the last 46 years of my uh, pastoral experience. They argue that fatherhood can mean nothing because human fathers are inadequate or my father was meaner than hell itself or my father was absent or others who say, oh, my father was wonderful, so God must be wonderful. But listen, it doesn't make any difference what your human father was or was not. Here's the proper response. If you had a great father, here's what you say. My dad was wonderful. I saw God in him, and it only makes me want to know this eternal father even more. Or if you had a terrible father, say this. My father disappointed me here and there, and he hurt me, and he abandoned me, but praise God, I have come to know a father who will never leave me, who will never forsake me, and he is always our Father which art in heaven. If you never knew your Father, don't even know who your Father is, here's what you say as a child of God. I've never known what it is to have a Father on earth, but thank God I have a Father in heaven who's with me now and it only gets better in the future. He is our Father which in is in heaven. He's God most high, but he's God most nigh. He's Abba Father. I, my father. That's the cure. That's the hope 
for all of these young people. It's not legislation. It's not gun control. It's not more governmental force. It's God invading their lives through other men and women who will model fatherhood and be willing to risk and take them under wing and disciple them and demonstrate what a real father looks like in spite of all your failures and flaws. They need to see what a man looks like, what a godly man looks like, what a godly father looks like. And God is calling us to that assignment. It's been our assignment all along. So Jesus gave us a vision of the Father's heart. Listen again, verse 9, chapter 14 of John. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, Philip just said in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father. That'll be enough. What do you think Philip had in mind? Show us the Father. I, I think he had in mind what Moses got to see. I think he thought, Lord, hide us behind a rock and cause the glory of God to pass by. I think he had in mind probably something like Isaiah saw in chapter 6. The Lord high and lifted up. Everything shaking and fearful in the awesome presence of this mighty majestic God. I think he had that in mind. But Jesus said, Philip, you missed it. Do you not understand that he who has seen me has seen the Father? Why? Because he and the Father are one. And he said, do, do you not understand that? So uh, Philip has not really at this point known Jesus because at the center of Jesus' Jesus's identity is his relation to the Father, a relation of such intimacy that Jesus can say, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus does not simply represent the Father, he presents him. Now that's for your notes, you need to write that down. You need to remember that Jesus doesn't represent the Father, he presents the Father. Where Jesus is present, the Father is present. Holy Spirit is present. But now I want you to turn very quickly to Exodus chapter 34. And we're going to look at verses 6 and 7 and see what this Father is like and see why anyone would not want to know a Father like this. Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. Now Moses in chapter uh, 33 of Exodus 33 verse 18 has said, show me your glory. In other words, show me yourself, God. So God puts him in the cleft of the rock and causes his glory to pass by. But let me tell you what's most impressive and most impactful, not what Moses saw, but what God said. Not what Moses saw, but what God said. And as the glory of God passed by, Moses is hidden by the, 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 the hand of God to keep him from being consumed by this powerful presence. Here's, here, here's what God said. Exodus 34, verse six. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, announced, declared, said, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. So Jesus both said and showed the Father, and here's what the Father is like. The Father told us what he's like. And very quickly, there are about six or seven things I want to mention in this passage, Exodus 34. First of all, he's compassionate. He's compassionate. Father cares tenderly, and compassionately. The first image of the father in Jesus' story in Luke 15 that we call the story of the prodigal son is in reality that of a tender, broken-hearted father. Unlike the distorted images that the enemy has sketched of God down through the ages, that God is tough, that he's terrible, that he's touchy, that he's temperamental, Jesus said the father is preeminently tender. He's, he's compassionate. He's tender and he's compassionate. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 103. Verse 13 says, and just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion 
on those who fear him. James 5.11, the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. The old Puritan John Owen said, the greatest sorrow and burden you can lay on the Father, the greatest unkindness you can do to him is not believe that he loves you. He loves you. So he's compassionate. Number two, he's gracious. He's not stingy. He's the God of the overflow. He's the God of the full bucket, not the half empty one. He's gracious. So Father loves graciously and passionately. John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him. We will and make our home, our dwelling place, our abode in him. Glory. Father loves graciously and passionately. He's not an austere being, impassively dispensing justice. Bam, wham. He does not merely smile kindly upon the good and the righteous. In fact, God's grace, his graciousness, his passion, it's almost undignified in its exuberance. Jesus revealed in Luke 15, a father God who runs and rejoices and embraces, not a dry, clean, sanitized boy, but a filthy, financially destitute, physically starving, wayward son who had spent it all. I had nothing but a speech. And the father killed the fatted calf. Someone said, if it had been me, I'd have killed the poor son. <laughs> but God is not like that. He's gracious. He's compassionate. There's a third thing. He's slow to anger. He deals patiently and understandingly. Someone said Luke 15 is the parable of the wayward lad and the waiting dad. The wayward lad and the waiting dad dad. Father was patient with his rebellious son away from home. Father was patient with his religious son in the home. And for me, it'd be easier to put up with the rebellious son than it would be the religious son, the self-righteous Pharisee in the house. But God is slow to anger. I was talking with the men in the class this morning. Thank God I'm not God. Thank God he doesn't respond like I respond. I'm, I'm not slow to anger. I want to be. I'm, I'm, I'm not as quick as I used to be because I don't have as much to back it up as I used to have to back it up. <laughs> now I have, to be, I have to watch my mouth because it'll overload other parts of my anatomy and I won't be able to get out of what I just said. <laughs> Understand, all of you chronologically challenged men? Amen. But God's not that way. He doesn't drop the hammer every time something goes wrong. He's merciful, slow to anger. That's the fourth thing. He's merciful. Father provides mercifully and generously. Matthew 5, 45. In order that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. This, 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 the, the reality, the experience of God being our heavenly Father is an indescribable blessing to his children who will quit stiff-arming him because of a father's absence or a father's abuse or an earthly father being such a poor example. Instead, look upon the heavenly Father through the Son, Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of God according to the Word of God, and you'll begin to see our Father, my Father, Abba Father, is a good, good Father. He's a good good father. All the time he's good. Even when things aren't good, he's good. He's merciful and he provides mercifully and generously. Fatherhood provides identity for sons and daughters. That's one of the key issues. Fatherliness produces an orphan spirit. An orphan spirit's always on the outside looking in, feeling like I never belong. I can never measure up. So when you come to understand who the Father is in relationship to you now through Jesus, then you have identity. You know who you are. You know who you are in Christ. Who am I? I am a son of the Father. My Father's also a king, so that makes me a king's kid in training for reigning. 
That doesn't mean I get everything that my tongue blabs, but it does mean that I want to talk to my father who's rich in houses and lands and holds all the wealth of the worlds in his hand. This is our father which art in heaven. And when you come to our father, ask him big things. Don't ask him for a nail keg to sit on. Ask him for a recliner big enough for a big man. He's not humble to sit on a nail keg when there's resources available to sit on a recliner. I don't want to get into all that, but I'm telling you, our Father will provide you with a sense of identity so that if it's your, your assignment to sit on a nail keg, you'll enjoy his presence on the nail keg more than you can in the recliner. Amen? I don't know where that came from, but it's good. Now listen, you'll never know your true identity and ultimate destiny until you know yourself as a son or daughter of God. You'll never, never know your true identity. You'll always be scrambling, always trying to prove. I think so frequently of Ted Turner who had a horrible, horrible relationship with his father, no relationship. And I remember when, when he uh, announced uh, all the success that he had and uh, CNN and uh, selling Turner uh, broadcast all of the advertising business and, and he pointed his finger. He maybe should have pointed down there instead of up there, but he said, what do you think of me now? What do you think of me now? He's talking about not God, talking about his earthly father, always trying to prove that he was somebody, that he did have dignity. But when you come to know the Father through the Son, you know that you have a settled identity. And nothing will change that. You didn't merit it, and you can't mess it up. Now, he may mess with you pretty heavily because whom the Father loves, he child trains pretty severely. He may beat the hell out of you to get you to heaven, but it's all in love that he does that. Amen? But a son can never know he's a son by focusing upon being a son. Our identification does not come from investigation of ourselves, but from the recognition of a relationship with Father God who affirms us and confirms us. Fatherhood provides identity. Fatherhood provides security. John 10, 29, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. That's better than life assurance or life security. That's eternal security in the Father and the Father in me. So I have security. I have identity. Fatherhood provides intimacy. We read it earlier, John 14, 23, he said, if you, you love me, I love you. The Father and I'll come and we'll make our house in you. My heart, God's home. My heart, God's house. Wow, what a father. But here's a fifth thing. He's truthful. Truthful means everything that confirms to reality. He's ultimate reality. Father admonishes truthfully and wisely. Hebrews 12, 16, or 12, 6 rather, he, he chastens, he disciplines the one he loves and does that for every son whom he receives. He's truthful. You can trust him. He will do what he promised. Number six, the father that I know that the Bible reveals that you need to know if you don't is faithful. Father relates intimately and faithfully. Earthly fathers may prove to be so unfaithful. Others around you, husbands, wives, may prove to be unfaithful. God, our Father, will relate to you intimately, personally, and faithfully. Psalm 37, verse three. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land. Listen to this. Feed on his faithfulness. Feed on his faithfulness. God's got a good record in my life. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. And it's the Father's love and the Father's grace that's brought me safe thus far. And guess what? The Father's love's gonna get me home. Amen. In his timing. In his timing. My times are not in doctor's hands or not even in Wade's hands. My, hand, my times are in the hands of a loving Father who loved me so much he'd rather die than live without me. 
And that's, that's true. That's not making me somebody. That's making him all and all. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What a father. What a promise. And last of all, he's forgiving. He's forgiving. Father forgives freely and he forgives frequently. Over the years, even as much theology as I've known, Times when, I've, times when I've sinned, I've said, Lord, if you'll forgive me this time, I'll never do it again. And after I did it again, Father said, you never merited the first time I forgave you. And I didn't think you were going to keep the promise anyway, so I did, I, I'm not, your relationship with me is not based on what you promised. It's not. You think it is. Well, you're in bad shape. You need to get, you need to, get to know this Father who forgives freely and frequently. <laughs> Again, one of the greatest revelations of the Father's hearts in Luke 15. If you really want to know what the Father's like, read Luke 15 again. He tells us that when the wayward son comes back from the pig pen of the far country without any money, without any merit, without any morals, without any marketable assets, with only a repentant, homesick heart and a rehearsed speech about wanting to be just a slave and not a son... What happens? The father runs to meet him, hugs and kisses him, interrupts his speech, puts a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet, a robe over his rag, and throws a party. (laughs) Throws a party. Not an inquest, but a party. He said, this my son was lost, and he's found. He was dead, and he's alive. It's time to celebrate. What a father that'll embrace a poor, wretched, wicked, hell-deserving prodigal son and say, welcome home, welcome home. I knew you were coming. i just been waiting. What a father. That'll take care of the gun problem. That'll take care of the crime problem. When we begin, not to sit in here and rejoice and celebrate father, but begin to take, especially young men, young boys, and demonstrate to them what a father is like and what the heavenly father is like. And then love them and then affirm them. Listen, when is a man a man? Only when another man tells him he's a man. And until that happens, he'll try to prove he's a man and he'll only be a boy. He'll only be a boy. And boys don't make good husbands. Boys don't make good leaders. But men need godly men Boys need godly fathers to say, as I'm building my love and life into you, I want you to know that God has a mark on your life. And it's not the mark of a curse, it's the mark of redemption. And he's called you to be his child. And being his child means that you're a man. And you don't become a man until you become God's man. And whether you're 10 or 100, when you become God's man, you become a real man. Not just a mistaken zipper's. a real man. He's forgiving. Here's the question and I'm finished. Is God your father? Do you know that you're a son or a daughter of the father, a child of destiny? Do you treat God as your father in heaven, loving him, loving what he loves? Honoring and obeying him, seeking and enjoying his fellowship, desiring to glorify him in all that you say and do. Or are you proud, humbly proud, but proud of your father and his family, unashamed to declare, hey, this, let me tell you about my father. Not ashamed of him. Are you? Or are you desirous of making more sons and daughters through the discipling process who will represent the father? Everything we're looking for in an earthly father and in our homes is found only and lastingly in a relationship with the perfect heavenly father. And when we come to him, we receive life for our deadness, direction for our lostness, strength for our weakness, healing for our sickness, clothing for our nakedness, love for our happiness so that we can say the best is always ahead for the child of God because I'm an exile 
headed home to the Father. Oh, who will come and go with me as you enjoy and celebrate life with the Father in his family forever. Now listen, knowing God as Father is considered impossible in all the world's religion. Impossible. Especially in Islam. There was a Muslim, Muslim noble woman in Pakistan. I've got her book. It's a great book. Her, her name was uh, Bilquis Sheik, very prominent lady, wealthy. And she was taking her grandson to visit this Christian doctor who was also a nun, Dr. Pia, Pia Santiago. And after the visit had concluded, she kept glancing at something in Billis. Uh, uh, Bilquis Sheik's lap. She was holding it. And she said, Madam Sheik, what are you doing with a Bible? And, and this stately woman said, well, I'm earnestly searching for God and I've been studying the Bible and the Quran. And she said, I've been so intrigued by Christianity since coming to know you. You seem to make God so, 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 I don't know, so personal. Uh, so the doctor just came closer and leaned over and said very softly, why don't you pray to God? Instead of just searching, why don't you pray to God and talk to him like you'd talk to a friend? And she was shocked. She said, as she smiled, she said, that'd be like trying to talk to the Taj Mahal. But then she couldn't get that out of her mind. So as she continued to think on that, the doctor said one parting word for you. She said, why don't you just... Uh, Talk to him as if he were your father. And it's just like a bolt of electricity shot through her. Father? Talk to him like a father? Well, that's blasphemy. In Pakistan, they'll cut your head off for, for making such blasphemous statements about God being the father. He's the great one, and he can't be brought down to human level. But then when she got home, she began to think, but, but what? What if? What if God really was like a father? And so that night she couldn't go to sleep. She pondered these thoughts. She pondered the words of this doctor and finally at midnight she got up and knelt down by her bed and she looked up to heaven trembling with excitement and uncertainty. She said, Oh, Father, my Father, Father God. And then she wasn't prepared for the sudden surge of confidence that followed that when she said suddenly, it was like in a vision, I saw myself as a little girl sitting with my head on the knees of a perfect heavenly father at his feet. And for a long time as I knelt there, he bathed my soul in billows of his love. And I rose up from there a daughter of the living God with God as my father in heaven. That's the same father that wants to draw you into his bosom and ravish you with his love so that you're ruined for everything else. That's the answer for bullet wounds. That's the answer for guns. It's not God in general, but God our Father revealed through human fathers and mothers who love this God and who flesh out and represent that God so that they come to know what it means to be wanted to have identity, security, intimacy, and a future that cannot be changed, is fixed and is fabulous. Our Father, do you know him? Bow your heads with me, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed. 